to the third in the, our webinar series for uh, Health Application Society. Uh, we have had two great, wonderful talks before. Today we have Mark Anoyan. Um, probably no, needs again no introduction. Mark's been the president or the chair of the society. Um, and uh, Mark's an old colleague. Uh, he was at Northwestern uh, before moving to um, Ann Arbor. Mark has done wonderful work all across operational operations research. He's done work in queuing. And I was really caught by his title today because I think he's become a convert on optimization. Um, so uh, Mark's gonna talk about patient experience versus efficiency, very, very important uh, keywords. Uh, and then uh, he'll talk about use of optimization methods possibly developing those and merging them with machine learning in broadly in healthcare. So with that, without much further ado, I'll have Mark take the floor um, and uh, educate us on you know, what he's been doing. Um, as, as you'll see in his last slide, he has had a long list of very um, um, successful graduates uh, that have been placed in industry and in top uh, business schools uh, and in uh, engineering. So, Mark. Thank you. Take us with your wisdom. Thank you. Uh, really appreciate your introduction, Sanjay. I also want to thank uh, 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 Sei Tung and uh, Jushi Chen for their uh, help with really getting the webinar series going. I think that it was uh, Sanjay's uh, brainchild and I'm really glad that uh, other, others have been helping him for, for months and months. And um, now we see uh, two more of you just, we're, we're getting to see you two, but there's a lot of other people behind it too. And we thank all of you and we thank Beth as well from Informs. So it's fantastic uh, to be here and I, I love the Health Application Society. You know, there's fantastic people in the Health Application Society. And if you aren't involved in it, um, yeah, I, I, I think that uh, you may find equal, but you won't find uh, a society with better people. It's fantastic. So um, let me uh, begin sharing my screen and just a minute, I don't think that worked right. Um, there, now I think. Mark, we're still seeing your older screen, please. Okay. Um, the one that actually has the webinar uh, flyer. Yeah, it's interesting. I keep uh, trying to point it to something else. Let me try it again. Usually works. Hmm. Still the same screen. Yes. Still the same thing. Why does it? Yeah, why does it do that? It's not. Um... If it's not working on your end, maybe you can quickly email your. Uh, I think, to me and I can. Uh, no, I think maybe I just have to um, exit my. Uh, my uh my i had the view i think of, we got uh, it right now i think we're seeing it you are seeing it okay yeah. let's yeah. see if if when i um let's just see if it still does it when yeah, i it, it, uh, i guess there's a second slide so if we get to the second slide the confusion will go away okay are you seeing relevant issues to be addressed yep perfect okay good <laughs> That was far more effort than I expected. I've never quite encountered this particular issue with Zoom before. So, uh, well, we're gonna go with it. Um, one of the things that I want to uh, talk about that I've been thinking about for quite a few years is uh, what it means to uh, be effective. And efficiency is great, but effectiveness means efficiency and other things. And uh, some of the the other things would be, uh, how long do you wait for a date, an appointment date? 
how long? Um, you know, it matters sometimes. Some people uh, don't use much health care. Maybe they don't have very many uh, urgent situations and they may not even realize it. Um, but access delay or indirect weight, as Gantin Gupta called it, um, can be very important, particularly when it's urgent. Um, so we're gonna look at that in the context of advance or in advance scheduling for coordinated surgical care. And another issue is that everyone is of course talking about is um, more stratified and personalized medicine. And of course with machine learning, data analytics being such a big thing, that's uh, obviously those are gonna go hand in hand. And I'd like to discuss some work on uh, bed placement, uh, assigning patients to the right unit. And that's gonna combine machine learning with optimization. I'll also be making some higher level comments. So uh, I thought that on a personal level, I would um, indicate to you that, uh, how, how did I get here in terms of the healthcare? Cause I didn't work in healthcare for about a half of my career. Um, and I didn't really see why I was a good candidate for, to work in healthcare because I just, I just didn't see how my background, I didn't see how my emphasis on production and service operations and you know, back a while, a while, maybe around 2006 and seven, I, at that point, I didn't really see myself as well positioned. I felt there were so many people better positioned and of course there were. Um, on the other hand, I had way too much experience when it came to personal health care insurance. And unfortunately, that trend has continued between me and people in my family. So that did give me a certain uh, heart for the area. And uh, certainly its importance was clear to me. Um, so after trying to help our department get around and get their arms around the area and the department, the College of Engineering to embrace it as well, I reached a point where I decided I had to put my money where my mouth was. And uh, so I started engaging in operations and medical decision-making for healthcare. So in terms of um, just background, so I've never really worked in a hospital healthcare institution with the exception of um, a nine month period where I was actually um, working part-time in a healthcare organization. Um, I have had great uh, fortune to be able to work with some really excellent healthcare institutions down there in the bottom left corner. And one thing I started doing in 2008 was I started teaching a senior design course in healthcare operations. And this uh, was something our, our department has been doing for 40 years. Um, and I get to work with people who took this class about 35 years ago. Um, so by the way, in the context of those senior design capstone courses, we're doing about 10, 11 projects per semester, all requested from the health system and approved and vetted by the chief operating officer. So um, that gives me a sense of the real nitty gritty. If you wanna be extremely practical and you're willing to be very short term, you, you see that um, a lot of times uh, industrial engineering tools, basic tools and Lean Six Sigma are going to uh, be what they, what they want, right? And it's less common that they want a simulation or that an optimization model is really going to help them. So obviously research is, is different, uh, at least for many of us if we're academics, right? So um, I've been able to work on a lot of different parts of the hospital. I had this idea that by picking off uh, areas uh, that over time I would get a better view of the entire system. 
Well, I'm still working on that one. It's pretty hard to get a really good view of the whole system. And I thought I should comment because the work I'm doing today, you will see some work that made its way into practice, but I'm not showing you my most practical work. Um, I think that we all have our idea of what's most important. And certainly when I got into healthcare, I was like, well, the only reason I should switch into healthcare was in hopes of having a positive change on how healthcare is delivered and, and that societal in, impact. So that, that was my whole goal, goal. And I have found through many experiences that as an academic, if I'm not teaching you know, the senior design class and, and delivering value that way, it is not easy for me to have that type of direct change that I would like. If I was working with a company that wrote um, something like an epic, you know, something that's writing these uh, systems, well, then the, these ideas I have for algorithms, I may be able to get into those products. But for now, they make so much money just doing very basic things. They're not, they've not been very interested in some of the great ideas that, that we have and are coming up with. So I would say we have to be open to embracing all levels. And so just because you're doing healthcare doesn't mean you shouldn't do some basic research that you think is going to help healthcare. Um, and certainly, uh, I think we need to value those that identify new applications and new approaches, um, even if they're not um, the top of the pile in terms of the depth of the methodology or, or you know, the, the theorems that were proved. So there's a whole range of value out there. And um, hopefully we can have partnerships across people in different roles to really get to where we want to be. So um, the, the first thing um, that I want to talk about is uh, patient experience as an area of emphasis. And um, here we go, I'm trying to get my computer to, to behave a little better. <laughs> as you can tell, it's been a little bit choppy so far with this computer. but. Um, Patient experience is an important thing that many, many um, hospitals are really starting to uh, uh, build departments in that area. And uh, one area that is affected that I'm going to talk about today is uh, uh, this, this, that, the matter of scheduling, clinic and surgical scheduling that's coordinated. And it needs to be something that can be done pretty much in real time. And I'm going to look at two ways to approach that problem. Um, on the personalization side of things that we were talking about, there's a bed placement problem that um, definitely benefits from a lot of personalization. And uh, the issue of readmissions reduction, which is important for patient satisfaction, experience, costs, and outcomes. So we're going to look at this concept of what if we try to look at bed placement in the right unit to get a reduction in readmissions on 30-day unplanned. And that will involve, uh, interestingly enough, uh, online learning and optimization. And I'll describe why later. Now, back to, is it okay to wait for care? The, the issue I'm pushing on you is we should care about these indirect waits or access delays. And so I was actually uh, working with the Veterans Administration. And as I was working on surgical scheduling, I noticed that the waiting time for certain procedures was well over six months. And I was actually quite disturbed by that. And I had to admit to them that the stuff we were working on was not going to eliminate a six month waiting time that was we were dealing with second order effects, and that's a first order effect. But we found, surprisingly, um, that they weren't interested. They were tied to an excellent hospital for their surgeons. That hospital health system was not supplying anymore. 
they felt that if they went and they hired additional surgeons that were coming from a different hospital health system or just simply outside that university, that they would anger the surgeons at that university. And anything that would potentially anger the surgeons in that university, they weren't willing to do. So they simply ignored the problem. Well, I didn't work too, too much longer with, um, with uh, on that project, uh, as you can imagine. So some years later, I was really saddened, but not entirely surprised to find that there was a major waiting list scandal when it came to surgeries, and it affected more than 10,000 patients. Um, supervisors were forcing schedulers to record uh, waiting times as zero so that they could improve their waiting time numbers. So clearly um, malign you know, activity. And um, there were more than 100,000 people that um, faced long waits and likely uh, approximately 200 people died because of that. So, a couple of opinions I have of what I'm thinking I would most acutely like to see in, in healthcare, realistically. I, I think this is what a lot of people want. I think they want, first of all, they want access to care, meaning getting care at all. Uh, but also as a second order, getting it in a timely fashion and they want healing. So this is not to be taken for granted. Uh, we are a very wealthy country. And we have about one in 11 people without health insurance according to uh, Census Bureau estimates. And this is after the Affordable Care Act, which I thought had brought it down lower than that. So that's a real issue. Um, next, this access delay issue, timely care, and that should depend on urgency. Thirdly, of course, everyone wants good care. They want to have satisfaction. They want to trust the provider. They want good outcomes. And it is true that access delay is not the worst evil. There are people, I know I was one of them, there have been times where I had a doctor that I, that was my doctor for, let's say a dentist, in fact, and I'm, I'm gonna do anything I can to stay with that guy. And if it meant a long way, it meant a long way. But of course, there's gonna be a risk of adverse events with that approach. Uh, people want wisdom. They want to understand what's going on. And that's not easy in our system as it stands. We often receive very siloed care um, we don't necessarily realize that the doctor clinician scope is as limited as it is. Um, we get diagnostic data, but that's not the same thing as wisdom. So getting this holistic coordinated care is hard. Um, finally, value. Uh, operations improvement is important. It's hard, it's really hard work. Uh, people don't realize how hard it is, but it is, it's super hard. And, uh, but it does matter. Um, and, uh, you know, all these uninsured people are partly a result of how expensive it is. And people not wanting to pay for other people's care and their taxes. So, a place where we definitely see a concern for waiting time is in the emergency department. And the majority of US hospitals now embrace this emergency severity index. And of course, the most important thing is the people who are dying and need to be resuscitated. But after that, the question becomes, can the patient wait? And if they uh, cannot wait, they will get an ESI level of two. Those that can wait will either get a three or a four or a five, depending on how many resources they would require. So ESI two and three patients, these two provide really good targets for uh, potential change. And just in 30 seconds, um, I did work quite a while ago on redesigning patient flow and targeting those ESI two and three 
we found that if you look at how the triage process is done, changes to the triage process and how triage information is used can, can be very important. Uh, they can estimate the complexity of a case quite accurately, but it's typically only used for three, four, and five um, level patients. But for twos and threes, this could be very important, particularly because we know that if we're trying to reduce adverse events that come from waiting for care without getting it, we need to look at how we can uh, look at the shorter cases to go first so we can lower the number of adverse events. So what we're saying is not that uh, a short patient goes before a more urgent patient. We're saying if you have patients in the same urgency class, so one and two, these are both in the uh, level two urgent patients. Some are simple, some are complex. We'll do the simple before the complex. And similarly for the um, for those that are non-urgent, the, the level threes, okay? so. That was just one idea. But this type of thinking is not very frequently found in the uh, non-emergency care. So when you're dealing with scheduling appointments in advance, they really are relying on making that appointment, of course, when it's requested, that's totally reasonable, but it's reactive in that there's simply very little thought other than first come, first served. And well, we can use the system to search for an appointment that's open, but there's not much other than that. And first come, first served is really, this, its strength is in high utilization. Its weakness is, of course, it doesn't differentiate across urgency. So when you get a high demand situation, even the very urgent patients will often end up waiting far too long. So I'm not the only one that I've seen work from a good number of other people that are dealing with this type of an issue, um, but it's a hard one. So I don't think you'll find tons of work out there. Well, it wasn't our first effort into this area, but it was one of our early ones. Um, when um, my student uh, Puyan Kazimian, who did do an internship there at Mayo, um, and, and they were, Dr. Uh, Larson of colorectal surgery had an interest, I'm not sure he found out about it, but interest in this notion of creating uh, different levels of access delay based on urgency. So, that group had about eight surgeons. And the reality was they were in very high demand. As you can imagine, it's the Mayo Clinic. So they're, they're gonna get demand for their services. But that meant that surgical cases generally had to wait 80 to 95 days. Well, not everyone can wait 80 to 95 days. That's a problem. And they recognized it. Now, a couple of features that make this problem not so easy to solve is that, of course, the first thing starts with getting you to the Mayo Clinic at, for a clinic appointment. And secondly, uh, once you get the clinic visit, you will determine, that will determine whether or not you need the surgery. And we ensure that they get the same surgeon. You gotta do that. They don't get to pick their surgeon. So that'd be another wrinkle. They don't pick it, but once you give them a clinic visit, you do surgery with that person, unless in a rare case, they really didn't like you. <laughs> um, so this doctor wanted to set these targets, these limits on how late a person could, or how long a person could wait. And there would be different patient classes, so we could accommodate different levels of urgency and some other consideration. And, um, Here's we'll say uh, the fraction of visits needing surgery was would be uh, predicted um, by a logistic regression is is what our choice was because that was an important thing to know in a personalized way. So we're going to have to model these daily level uh, calendars for the surgeons, and we're going to take a heuristic approach, so it won't be hard to incorporate that sort of thing. Um, so these types, we're gonna label five different types. And 
I want to focus on the indication, the urgency of the disease is important. And it's possible for there to be some cases where it's desirable to wait longer, for instance, to achieve weight loss. Um, they do have to care about geographical zones like your clinic visit, if you're coming far away, we want to wait at least five days to give you that clinic visit so you have time to get here. And uh, referral type, there's a few other, those are the three main things. So they came up with five categories. One of them, uh, clinic visit only did not have a maximum wait time, but the surgery types uh, were three days, 10 days, 20 days, 40 days. Now that's asking a lot considering the average before was like 80 to 95 days, right? So we're talking a major, major change in what they're, what they're asking for. And using their current systems, this would result in very large amounts of overtime. And we'll use overtime as a way of trying to compare apples with apples when we're dealing with uh, the way they do things and a, and a new way of doing things. So the, the flow is like this. Here's the request. Here's the right after a request, right away, we want to make a clinic appointment decision. Uh, this clinic appointment will be governed by guidelines on waiting time. If you're a local, you can go tomorrow. <laughs> if you're coming from across the world, you know, we're going to give you five days before we would schedule that appointment. But there's uh, on the other end of the spectrum, well, let's see, let's go sequentially. So when you have the clinic appointment, you will get some new information. You will get a realization of whether or not they need surgery. So if they don't need surgery, they exit the system. Well, this is really quite important because when that person doesn't need a surgery, you don't want to be wasting capacity. If you'd been thinking, well, we are going to give you surgery next week, but now you don't need it, we don't want that to go to waste. Um, uh, a good fraction of the patients do need surgery, so we need to um, make sure that is solid. Um, and then, and in practice, they waited until this point to make that surgical this timing decision. When the surgical date comes, of course, that's when you're going to find out how long that surgery actually took, which is important to our methods. And based on those decisions, you know, we're really looking for what was uh, the what were the uh, clinical and surgical overtime levels under a policy. So when we look at that whole process, we're going to simulate it. We're going to be measuring uh, what kind of overtimes we're getting. So. All right, I think. So the current approach, I will briefly say that you're looking at um, the earliest available clinic, and then you'll get your surgical appointment scheduled later. Um, we're going to book the clinic and the surgery both up front. We're going to lock them in up front, but we can release the surgery date later. Um, we're, we already talked about the logistic regression. And one insight to just make this a little more interesting is our heuristic methods are going to have to look at a person who has a low chance of needing surgery. And we're going to say, we want to schedule with, with you as much time between your clinic and surgery date as possible. Now, we, don't, we can't let the surgery date go beyond the target date. But we're going to try to push it toward that. Why? If the surgery ends up not being needed, we're going to need all the time we can get to get another patient to arrive who can get a clinic visit and a surgical visit in to use that time and not waste it. Okay, so that's kind of shows you some of the complexity in the thinking. And again, we have to make sure it's, it's with the same provider that we don't mix and match providers. So it's heuristic based and you know, heuristics is actually very interesting and it's wonderful for people who have good intuition and care about intuition because it's, it's a great way to learn from how the system behaves. I'm gonna kind of briefly show you. So to make it apples to apples, we force their current way of doing things to live within these 
await time targets. That meant more overtime. So the uh, current policy here in blue has, has very high levels of overtime. And what we're showing is that in the red, the policy that we came up with that doesn't require a uh, search uh, does you know, dramatically better, um, often about 52% of the uh, cost is saved. So obviously uh, your volume and how you set those targets will determine how much overtime you have. But, um, and of course there was a version where we did uh, simulation optimization of a key parameter to get a little bit better, but that's not really critical here. So in fact, it, this was something we designed so that we could get results in a really good performance without taking forever, which is unfortunately often the case with the more rigorous my work is, <laughs> the longer it takes. Um, but interestingly, and I, I found this, I've heard of this a lot. It happens in business, certainly happens even more, I think in healthcare where if surgeons or, or administrators don't understand something, unfortunately, it can be reluctant for them to use it. And so they wanted the method to be simplified further. And Mayo has um, excellent people and they could revise the method into something that used a simpler approach and they could implement it. And um, the surgeons were very, very pleased and it was doing what they hoped it would. So that was an example of something that was hoped to be practical. It still needed further work before the people were willing to use it. Now, of course, that kind of a problem is this is, the, this is gonna appear in multiple contexts. Um, and I, I won't go into, we don't have time to go into all those contexts, but I really wanted to know, you know how do you do this in a way that uh, you don't have to, it's not each one being, a one-off. You don't need to go through a simulation and spend months and months developing your intuition, but that you could uh, put it into an optimization approach. And I'll say that we've come up with more than one optimization approach. Um, this particular student, Esmil Kivan Shoku, um, really loves stochastic programming. He was really keen to develop a method that would use stochastic programming. So that's what we're going to uh, talk about next. This is Esmail Kivan Shoku. Yeah. And another challenge is different types of uncertainty. Well, you know, Esmail is a person who is very, very eager to uh, take ideas and, and instantiate them in problems and figure out how to make them work. Um, so he was interested in how uncertainty modeling could uh, be used to push further along the types of problems we can solve. And so, well, we have a Poisson arrival process model for the patient request. Again, you can debate, again, that could be a different model, but that is a, a reasonable starting point. The need for surgery, that is as before. We're going to take it though as IID Bernoulli outcomes for whether or not the patients, and that was like about a one in three chance being surgery. And the service, duration, service, service time duration, surgery durations, that's where we invest a lot of um, thought with a distributionally robust approach to these um, service time dur durations. And so we just assumed that we would know the mean, the standard deviation, and max and min uh, support values. And any distribution, the worst distribution satisfying those statistics would be the one by which the performance would be judged. That way, we would not be sense, highly sensitive to the service time durations. And we could go into why surprisingly um, <clears throat> different surgery types, there's often many surgery types that you don't have many cases, so you can't get very accurate distributions for it. Again, it depends on your setting. So it's the same problem almost exactly as before. Okay, so don't need to review this. And suffice to say, I talked to you about how you know, there's a, a maximum time on when the surgery occurs. That's our main goal. 
we have some constraints on um, how, how long you have to wait to bring them in for a clinic visit in case they're from far away, for example, based on their type. Uh, and there's some other things about what kind of a gap you want to leave between clinic and surgery. You can specify some constraints on how close those come together. So one important thing was in an effort to show that this could be practical, we needed to create a way to deal with a long-term horizon. So we created a rolling horizon implementation. Another thing that goes along with our method and our attempt to um, basically be absorbing the most recent information becoming available on each day was um, we needed to use some level of batching. For example, in maybe the worst case, uh, wait, wait till the end of the day, collect all the arrivals on that day, and then decide what their appointment dates would be. So this approach is not something I can go into tons of details. So the, in terms of appointment requests and knowing that they're Poisson, there's a multi-stage stochastic programming framework. Now this DRO approach and the ambiguity uh, information on the distribution is going to complicate things dramatically to put that in a multi-stage uh, stochastic programming context. I think it's the first time it's been done to my knowledge. And so needed to um, develop a tractable formulation based on exploiting analytical uh, results from the special structure of the model. And then to make it something that you could solve in a reasonable amount of time, we needed to be clever with constraint generation algorithm and prove that it would converge to the optimal policy. And then finally, uh, set that in a rolling horizon procedure with an additional level, level of complexity. Now, let me show you what benefits um, we got from this. Now, I would first like to have you kind of look at this red. We're showing here with this line, the average surgical access delay, how long they're waiting in this case. And, and this time, imagine the system is starting out fresh. And then as you roll forward in time, you're accumulating people in the system and you're accumulating experience. It's going to take a little while for the, the queues to build up and the waiting times to build and that sort of thing. Um, so that's why there's an upward trend. And the bars are showing you 95% confidence intervals on those access times. And so, and by the way, the, um, these numbers are not directly comparable with the previous ones because this uh, problem where we're solving is different. Uh, the numbers are different than before. And the scale is smaller. So um, next, if you look at this green curve at the bottom, the very best one in terms of the average, that was a, uh, not a distribution robust model. That was one where you had the um, uh, a stochastic model, a stochastic model. And so the distributionally robust one is the blue one that's close to the green, but a little bit worse performance. But the thing to notice is not the little bit worse performance. When you go from a stochastic model of reality to a distribution robust optimization that's compatible, you have to trade some performance for robustness. So do we get that? Well, if you look at the width of the blue intervals, you see that they are distinctly better than the green. Uh, you know, sometimes um, half as much, sometimes less than half as much, but distinctly better for a modest drop in performance. And I guess one, um, and, well, we, we don't, I can't show you all the other results. I'm just trying to go over this quickly to kind of sur survey things a bit more is um, the care coordination piece is really important. And if you look at the way they were doing things in practice, there were some fundamental mistakes in their intuition. And so their intuition led them to do some uh, unfortunate things. Now, okay, um, won't have much time, but 
more about the personalization and, and, and stratification, really, we are looking at this bed placement uh, problem. And we've been able to do this in a personalized setting, highly stratified, you know, lots of context information, and one that was uh, fewer uh, categories. And that's the one I'm going to talk about. There are certain benefits to that. And my current student, Mohammed Zalechian, was the lead on, on this work. And um, the, your risk of readmission is something hospitals care about and you care about. And the unit, the type of unit you're placed in matters. And various people have, have shown that. But we're just going to look at the three, three basic types, a general ward, general bed unit, a step-down unit, and the highest level of care is the intensive care unit. So is there a framework to help the decision makers decide who gets the general bed, whether they really should get a step-down or an ICU? That's a problem that's been solved um, in various ways by various people and their software to help with that and so on. What we're doing here is really um, a very much a research project where we're saying there's not a lot of research on how to uh, do this type of bed placement optimally. And certainly from the perspective of readmission, um, people have not done much with how does the placement decision affect your readmission rate. So we're doing sort of a, um, a, a lower bound. We're basically trying to take a model and say, well, suppose our goal is to reduce readmissions. How well can we do that if, if, we're, if we're allowed to make these placement decisions? Okay. So it's, it's not designed to be something that we could just implement in a year from now. Okay, there, there's more work to be done for sure. And we have to change our objective. So we are going to deal with finite capacity units. So that's a really complicated problem. It's a dynamic queuing control problem. It's a network. And we're gonna to have to simplify that. Okay, and we, we do, we simplify it quite dramatically so we don't have this full queuing model. Um, another problem with this is the beds are reusable and that ability to recycle them after cleaning means that a lot of the literature that would apply doesn't actually apply. The bandit with a knapsack work does not apply directly. Another thing you yourselves with is uh, learning. Now, we've been through COVID. COVID-19. We've watched hospitals that didn't know what to do with COVID-19 patients. Michigan made separate units for them all. Indiana never did. Um, they don't necessarily know um, who should go into a unit and which unit should they be in a step-down unit, ICU, or regular bed. So they're, they're guessing. Now, the tricky thing about uh, online learning and learning in general is that there's exploration. And in healthcare, we get really nervous about that. Now, in clinical trials, that's what they have to do. And there's, so there's a lot of ethical boundaries surrounding how you do a clinical trial, right? In healthcare operations, um, things are viewed very different than when it comes to pills and medication, very different. And the fact of the matter is hospitals are always experimenting. The way they do things operationally is usually a function of common sense and history and whoever was in charge wanted it that way. So the barriers surrounding exploration are, are not as bad. We do need to worry about um, these types of models with these sort of band, contextual bandits. They, they have a problem with being myopic. And so we don't want to be more myopic than we have to be, but we don't have a perfect solution for that either. Another challenge that this presents is delayed feedback. You, so what do I mean? It's pretty obvious. Uh, this guy gets a bed, stays in there for some number of days, and then oh, they get readmitted within 30 days. Within 30 days, it is taken legally to mean that was unplanned readmission. Well, if it was not planned and happened within 30 days, they will generally flag it as a 30-day readmission. 
that uh, would sort of be a, a black mark that you count. Um, so depending on the length of stay in the hospital and how long before you get discharged, you, you'll get information delayed in time. And of course, in the worst case, the longest case, not the worst case, it's actually the best case, is uh, they stay in the hospital for some number of days or a day or five days, and then they spend 30 days or more without returning. And then after 30 days plus the length of stay, we'll get this delayed feedback saying you had a success. That person avoided the readmission. Well, I am uh, kind of uh, needing to wrap up soon just so there's a little time for Q&A. So I'll try to um, hit some highlights. So we clustered the patients and in, in our setting, we had uh, a doctor I worked with had developed one of the first mortality risk predictors in the nation. They made tremendous use of this mortality risk predictor. So in fact, we, we uh, clustered on a number of features, but you'll see that as the patient type increases, um, you'll see that the mortality re risk is, is increasing. So these are, it's a partition of, of zero one. And it does, it is the case that um, age is definitely correlated with mortality. There, there's no question. But we had other, other things involved as well. And um, we are going to assume a time-bearing Poisson arrival process, and we're going to assume memoryless length of stay. That is going to be a known. We're not going to try to make that <laughs> distributionally robust. <laughs> um, that would be a bit much. We've got enough on our hands. Um, so this context can be quite large. It could uh, involve quite a lot of information in their diagnoses and demographics and, and things like that. And the way the, this learning algorithm works, let's just start here with uh, a new patient information. We find out that today, let's say um, six people arrived or three people arrived, and we need the contextual information for each of them. And the model has a logistic regression at its core for predicting risk of readmission. And so we predict as best we can those risks. And then we have a part of the algorithm that optimizes this bed allocation, which unit is the best one. And it needs to have the occupancy or the queue length information. I'm not showing that here, but um, that's really critical. Then, like we said, <laughs> the, today's decisions we won't learn from for, for a while, but decisions made in the past, when we'll get some of those back today probably. And so we want to update our perception of readmission risk from them. And so we iterate. And so I am not going to take the time to talk about the steps, um, estimation, then optimization. And there we, we end up using an approximate model that can be cast as a linear program. And it constrains that on average, you don't exceed the capacity, but not in, utiliz not in uh, realization. So we have to worry about there being some blocking. We have not completely prevented that. And that LP tells how to allocate the patients until the next iteration. And then we get the feedbacks, update that, and then um, update uh, the beliefs in this unknown vector W of the logistic regression model. So um, regret, regret is something I don't think we want to spend time on, um, but we have this Bayesian regret and we can actually prove about that compared to the closest models in the literature, we can achieve the same level of regret over time or a gap, if you will, and in some cases better than the prior literature. To give you a little sense of, of how this works, imagine you're starting up over time. Now, what we're used to and what we're modeling here in this bottom one, this has the least regret, the best performance. There we took 300 patients and used their data to provide a prior 
to the algorithm. And you'll notice it really likes that prior because it starts out better and its slope is better through the range we're seeing. The next one is, is our favorite algorithm that we spent so much time on. And that one um, has, is starting from scratch, has to learn from scratch. And we're comparing UCB and a linear Thompson sampling to you know, show how our model is compared to others. And the bottom line is, yes, you can in increase the success rate of avoiding um, readmissions. Yes, you can achieve some nice improvements. So sort of that, that bound idea that, yes, if that's all you cared about, you, you can increase at least the success rate. Another little graphic that gives you a little bit of intuition is you, you can see that due to exploration, you'll see those, those widths. You'll see that at first it's, it's doing a lot of uh, you know, learning and then it starts settling in and you see that the hospital down here in gray, the, the different online methods are all better and they haven't even reached you know, steady state. There's still this uh, truncated to show you this early learning phase, but here's ours on, on top and how it, you know, it's, you can see those bands there that you know, you're clearly doing better than the, um, the traditional. And you know, we went and looked into it and um, I see my clock. <laughs> okay. So um, yeah, you, you learned that uh, there's only one category where this PAC algorithm did worse than the hospital. And you learn things like the areas where we had the, the greatest benefit had the highest percentage of renal, COPD, sepsis, and liver disease. And they were also admitted through the emergency department. So if we were to go further and deeper, the couple of questions we would ask would be, um, well, the robustness problem, we were relying on uh, what, the ability to estimate the arrival process. So one thing is, is that, getting rid of that. Um, and another might be concerns about bias, particularly racial bias. And that has been an issue in things like um, uh, eligibility for discharge. And so with the data you're using, it is possible. I'm not saying it's obvious to see how when it comes to readmission re reduction, but um, then again, I'm not saying it, it can't happen because you do have data that can correlate with race. Okay, so um, I am going to skip over the nice things I was gonna talk about there of our ideas of how to deal with that. And I would just like to thank uh, you, the audience, for being here with me in spirit and uh, certainly my collaborators and former students, of course, most of which didn't contribute to this work, but um, helped me get here to where I am working on these things. So I guess it's time to turn it over uh, to uh, either Sate or Sanjay. Should I stop my sharing now? No, I can share this. I think it's kind okay. of nice. Um, Maybe I can start with a question. We only have a few minutes. You know, you talked early on about your um, your struggle in terms of, you know, what got you into healthcare and then also, you know, the challenges of trying to make a difference on the ground. Yeah, okay, so, um, right. So since I had, like everyone else, been trying to be, good at something and I, you know, I felt I was good at understanding um, queuing networks and the control of queuing networks was sort of a, a core skill. And I'm, a, I'm not an algebraic thinker, I'm a geometric thinker and I'm a intuitive guy. Um, so then like when I started trying to convince everyone else how great healthcare was, I convinced myself in the process, I figured I was just trying to do it for other people um, to help the department, you know, other people in the department. And it turned out then I jumped in and I think that I had um, some of the healthcare I dealt with uh, was uh, musculoskeletal. And, you know, I, I spent um, high school, most of it in a brace, which was incredibly socially awkward and difficult. But I, it's the type of treatment where you need to work with your doctors. If you don't, ultimately I decided if I hadn't told my doctors what I thought they needed to do, it might not have been successful because when you're dealing with ortho,
orthotics or, or things that are trying to realign your spine, um, they don't feel what you feel. And so you really have to work with them. And, and my mom was very big advocate um, and really pushed doctors for good doctors and that kind of thing. And so, you know, I, I knew that, you know, doctors were not omniscient and uh, could benefit even from patients. And I knew that some people did healthcare. It was just that, well, they're such a head start on me, you know, why would I do it? But I felt that um, Michigan did offer uh, potentially a really good place because of the incredible quality and magnitude. I mean, the University of Michigan Health System now uh, brings in revenues of about four and a half billion dollars a year. So it's not a small operation. And, you know, it employs about 15,000 people. Um, now then getting into the details, I did have the benefit of some people who were very practically um, minded people, people who had done things in industry, even if they were academics or people who were in industry. And they, I spent time with them and what they thought were good problems. And um, that's partly how I picked the earliest problems I worked on. I took people like Walt Hancock that had, was really big into patient flow smoothing and getting a uh, higher efficiency, higher occupancy, and uh, trying to um, make his thinking uh, bring more modern methods to it. And fortunately with my student, Jonathan Helm, he was extremely innovative and came up with ways to build new uh, random, uh, random field models to describe these complex network flows through the hospital so that you could in fact tame that queuing network and eventually shoehorn it into a mixed integer program. So over time I would struggle between, you know, I wanna do something implementable. And then I found I, I couldn't publish it. And then I would um, try to walk both, do both something that I thought was practical and publishable that can be hard to publish because you tend to get a reviewer that likes the practical part, not the theoretical, and one likes the theoretical, not the practical. And I, I don't think there's a perfect formula and it's, it's gotta be personalized because if you're a person who's really good at basic research, well then, you know, you're probably gonna help the field more by looking at what the applications are and finding out how you could bring revenue management and other literature to bear. On, on these problems because you can't translate them directly. The objectives, the criteria, the constraints are not the same, the, the needs are not the same. So healthcare is more complicated, generally speaking. So that was the short version. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, and, and you shared so much of a personal stuff with me, Mark. That's why I have so much respect for you uh, uh, for working in the, in the space of healthcare. You know, um, I'm really happy that you could come and, and, and present. Oh. And the fact that you're so open in presenting your own, some of your own uh, uh, examples and experiences. Um, I mean, that we don't see it often in people, but you know, that candid sharing really, I think, motivates a lot of us because you know, at the end of the day, as you have it in your uh, title, it's patient experience. And once you have been in the shoes of a patient, there's no beating of that experience. I can tell you that. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it can be no a very hard experience, experience, but it does have, uh, it definitely has its value. Oh, huge value. <laughs> it completely reorients your brain. Yeah. Uh, at least it did mine. Um, I, I, just a couple of acknowledgements here. We've got uh, Xiao Jin Wang uh, from Xinhua uh, basically uh, commenting, thanks um, to you. Uh, it's a good talk and a nice experience in healthcare and kind of acknowledging, you know, the way you shared it. Got another comment from Bob Bat, who's saying, thanks, Mark. A really interesting view of uh, some of your work. I don't see any other technical questions. And of course, um, if people have technical questions about Mark's presentation, um, he, you can reach out to him directly. Uh, also importantly, uh, some of his papers are in the public domain, so um, you can obviously be reading those. But with that, Mark, 
Thank you so much. Really appreciate you um, taking all the time to present. I know you have teaching to do and you're doing some of the <laughs> yeah, things. Actually, it's not <laughs> right. But I wanted to get somebody uh, who was at the top, you know, who's seen half has from top down to actually <laughs> yeah. uh, present. And you being the most recent immediate class, or so probably a couple of years back, um, was for me the perfect choice. So oh, thank, thank you. Again. Thank you again. Really appreciate it. Uh, glad to be here. Thanks to everyone for joining us.